All right, welcome back. 90 minutes before eight here on the program. Former Western Cape Premier and DA Alliance or Democratic Alliance leader Helen Zilla has joined forces with the Institute of Race Relations as a senior policy fellow. The IRR says it's collaborating with Zilla and will create a loud reformist voice in the country. It says Zilla's appointment will influence the IRR's bid to stop land expropriation without compensation. So let's talk to the lady herself in our parliamentary studio. We've got Helen Zilla. Good to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here, Leanne. Thank you. So I suppose the first question is why, why the Institute of Race Relations? Why did you decide to, to join them? Well, they've become a very forceful voice in South Africa, and they've become a forceful voice on issues that I believe very strongly in, liberal values, the rule of law, private property and the extension of property rights in South Africa to all, ways of ensuring that rights are defended and expanded, opportunities for all, those really important values I want to continue to be a voice for, I've done my time as the leader of a party. I've done my time in executive office in government. And I want to continue the battle of ideas. Mm. You, you, you mentioned a very powerful voice. Who, who do you believe that the, the, the Institute of Race Relations actually speaks for? Who is the powerful voice? Well, the Institute for Race Relations is the powerful voice. But we firmly believe that history up till now has shown that in a democracy, you get prosperity when certain values are upheld. The rule of law, a capable state, a culture of accountability, and in the rule of law, for example, very strongly, goes property rights. And if you start messing with that, you destroy the banking system, you destroy any f possibility of investment, and the economy collapses. And that would be a disaster, especially for the poor. They've got no alternatives. Mm. So we have to grow the economy and create the conditions for economic growth. And that, of course, is in the interests of everyone. So we believe that the broad philosophical approach of liberal democracy is in everyone's interests, but we will be the voice for that approach because it's become rather muted in recent years. Yeah. A lot of people would obviously disagree with you, and you know that. It's not something that you know, you're not immune to. And many people saying that uh, this isn't the voice of the general public and the general South African. When you look at the plight of many South Africans, what you're speaking to is, is not their interest. And they are more worried about putting food on their table and actually getting their rights served. And that with regard to land expropriation, that how do you give people what they deserved when it was wrongfully taken from them in the first place? I mean, these are some issues, obviously, that need to be addressed and looked at. Let's look at those two issues that you've raised. First of all, food on the table. You won't put food on the table unless you have a job. And if the economy collapses, you won't have a job. We now have 10 million people unemployed, and I heard on the news coming in here today that in fact there's been a warning that there'll be more people unemployed. So you can't look after your basic needs and your interests without a job. And if the economy collapses and if there's no investment, fewer and fewer people will have jobs instead of having a growing economy with more and more jobs. And we stand for policies that drive growth and jobs. And that seemingly, even by your own analysis, is in the interests of everyone. Secondly, I completely agree that if anything wrongfully was taken from someone, it needs to be given back. And we certainly strongly support the extension of property rights. But if you're going to take away land that people have paid for and bought without compensation, usually with big bonds from the bank, you're going to immediately collapse the banking system. We totally support land reform. There are hundreds of millions of hectares well, hundreds of thousands of hectares in South Africa, probably millions of hectares, that are already in black hands, but are not producing any food or jobs. And that is the challenge. How do you ensure that that land is owned by the people who work it to give an incentive to create food, to create viable farming entities, and to create jobs? That is what we have to do. There are millions of hectares in government possession that's lying there fellow, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And we believe that a large part of the land reform challenge lies in our cities so that people can get a home near their places of work. They can feel vested in ownership in their cities and feel part of an inclusive South Africa. Mm -hmm. So absolutely we support it. Yeah. But we don't support methodologies that will destroy the economy. 
because that is going to be terrible for everyone, especially the poor. Mm -hmm. Certainly, and I mean, I don't, I don't think people can disagree with your sentiments, but I suppose a lot of people will ask the question then, and I need to ask it as well. How do people get justice for the wrongs that were committed against them? And yes, we, we do talk to an ideal world where everybody can work together, but that wasn't the case many years ago. And there was expropriation of land without compensation that took place. How do we bring about justice and get it to the rightful owner? Well, there is supposed to be a mechanism right now. And we know that that is completely bogged down in inefficiency and incapacity in the state. There have been two windows for people to apply for land that was wrongfully taken away from them, and those issues should have been sorted out long ago. I mean, in District 6, we know exactly who the beneficiaries are. We've been working for years and years. It's a complex process with squabbles amongst the beneficiaries, with huge problems with tender processes and various other things, and the provincial and the local government not having the power to do the anything. So there is a process, if it only worked, there wouldn't be the need for all of this recrimination around it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work because we have an incapable state that pours billions into producing no results. I think there was a statistic from the agricultural sector that said that with all the money that has already been spent fruitlessly on land reform, they could have bought almost half the commercial farmland at market-related values. That is how inefficient the system is. Did you join the Institute of Race Relations to help them stop land expropriation with compensation? Is, is this the real reason why you joined them? The real reason is that I am a Liberal Democrat, and under apartheid I was seen to be far left, and people called me communist. And today, strangely enough, the values of non-racialism, the rule of law, an inclusive market-based economy is suddenly seen to be right-wing. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. I still believe in the same things that I believed in when people were calling me a communist. Non-racialism has become a conservative value because people, again, are seeing only biology, only the color of your skin. So I joined the Institute of Race Relations because they are a clear voice for things like constitutionalism, the rule of law, non-racialism, of which Property rights are only one element. Okay. What other elements are you looking at? I suppose it's, 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 it's also a, a, a fair question. What are those top issues that you would like to see addressed? Well, the top issues that I would like to see addressed are the expansion of opportunities and the question of not blaming people because of their biology for the problems this country faces. To say that whites and whiteness are the problem in South Africa and extend that to other minorities, which is rapidly, rapidly ha happening, as we've seen, through Indians and other minorities, is a disaster for South Africa. To go back to racial contestation rather than building the non-racial middle of South African politics, building the non-racial middle, which is where most South Africans are. If you look at most South Africans, they get on with their lives, they want to get on with each other. But we are being driven apart by this new racist racial ideology that says whites and minorities are the problem in South Africa. Now, the most important thing you need in a country of our level of development is skills. And here we are failing through the education system to build enough new skills while trying to drive many people who have skills out of the country. It is a disaster for the economy, which means it's a disaster for the poor. So one of my top priorities will be to build the moderate center of politics where I believe, and I think opinion polls also indicate, most South Africans actually are. Yeah. You talk about, about uh, the issues and, and um, whites and whiteness and um, the, the middle groups that you, you're referring to. And I know that this was one of the reasons that you also spoke to wanting to join the Institute of Race Relations. But I, I, I dare to go here, but I have to because it is, it is a conversation that many talk to when they refer to you, is the issue of white privilege. And, and you don't believe in something like white privilege. In fact, once you were... Um, Talk, talk, spoken to it about on Twitter, you came back referring to black privilege. But do you still not believe that white privilege does exist and has existed for all these years? I believe it would be fatal to generalize on a racial basis. The very bottom line of liberalism is that you don't 
generalize along the lines of specific categories of people and specifically not on the basis of their biology, for example, gender, for example, race, for example, sexuality. Now, to say that white privilege is the problem in South Africa is first to fundamentally misdiagnose what the problem is. The problem is an incapable state, the collapse of the rule of law, and policies that don't drive economic growth and lead to joblessness. That is the problem. Answering that problem by saying whiteness is the issue and whites A, deflects us from solving the real problems and B, scapegoats and marginalizes many people who want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So I reject racial generalizations, whether they are about black people or whether they are about white people. And I've shown up the absurdity of making racial generalizations about white people by showing how absurd it would be to make racial generalizations about black people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, whites were privileged under apartheid. Many were very poor. In my own case, my greatest privileges are having grown up with two parents who instilled values very strong values. We were very poor. My parents were refugees. But I know how privileged I am because I had opportunities. And it's precisely those opportunities that I want to extend to everybody. And it doesn't help to drive out of South Africa those who have the skills to do so and those who want to participate and be part of the mainstream. Yeah. It doesn't help at all. Yeah. You know, I, I suppose maybe what, what one has to look at, and, and, and it is a big question that white people need to, to ask ourselves and and I and, and I'm speaking to you as a fellow white person do you not believe that we were given the privileges and are still given the privileges purely because we are white and I mean I don't think we can ignore that fact I really don't I mean we're seeing a series of your tweets coming through um, you know talking to black privilege and this don't you think this particular tweet where you speak to black privilege you say that people shouldn't generalize but wouldn't you say this is a generalization where you talk to black privilege and you're saying that um, uh, it is being able to loot a country and steal hundreds of billions and get re-elected I know you're talking to politics but this is not talking to the general black person in this country you talk to non-racialism and yet you are generalizing well, let me tell you that that tweet was part of a conversation in which people were generalizing about whites and white privilege. And that tweet, I sent them back to show how absurd it is, mm. how absolutely absurd it is. Because to define privilege in one specific way, I mean, how do you find a situation where since 1999 I've been writing about state capture, where we've been talking about the risks and the dangers of state capture for years and years, and Jacob Zuma gets elected not once, but twice. And always on the basis of demonizing whites. So that we land in this complete crisis of the economy where we are now. And people are still blaming whites rather than looking at the real cause of it. And are still re-voting that very same government that led us to this mess into power. So to continue to blame whites, someone's got to show up the absurdity of that. And yeah. that's precisely what I did. It yeah. is absurd yeah I'm going to ask you a genuine question and I mean you've been in politics for <laughs> most of your your career and your life and it's something that's Im embedded into you do you believe that we've ever healed as a nation honestly have we healed as a nation can we be speaking of conversations where um, a population shouldn't be blaming whites and I I, I ask this genuinely for, for their problems, for their issues, and their circumstances that they are still in, without actually p possibly having maybe apologized, maybe coming forward and, and admitting that, yes, we did have privilege, and we still do have privilege. And privilege goes back generations. It's not something that you adopt overnight. Um, you know, you have a family that has worked. You got a job because your family was able to educate you. You got a job because you walked through the door and automatically, being white, you were treated in a very different way to a black person who would walk in for the same position. You know, these are just some instances of privilege that I talk to. And, you know, aren't these things that we need to acknowledge in order to move forward and accept that, yes, we do come from a privileged background that goes back generations and it's not something we can just look at in the last 25 years. 
Leanne, I have never denied that whites were privileged under apartheid. And again, I say you can't generalize. When my parents were starting out as penniless refugees, other people were very wealthy. So the bottom line is that you cannot generalize. That's the first point. The second point is, yes, we have this tragedy in South Africa where under apartheid and at 1994, there were about 3.6 million people unemployed. Now there are 10 million people unemployed. So let's look at the last 25 years. To try and go back 300 years is to deflect attention from what we've been doing in the last 25 years. And what the ANC government has been doing in the last 25 years is blaming whites. Has that made anything better for black people? No, because there are now 10 million people unemployed and growing. So if you look at the circumstances in which people live today, which I completely agree are terrible and should never be like that, what is the biggest barrier to their advancement? Is it white people? No. Is it a collapsing economy? Yes. Will scapegoating whites help to grow the economy? No, quite the contrary. So we must define our enemy properly collectively as a nation and do something about the real enemy, which is an incapable state, which is a collapsing economy because of all these crazy policies and statements, and which is an education system that despite billions is not showing adequate signs of improvement. Those are the real enemy. Yeah. And to scapegoat whites is exactly what it says, is to try and find a red herring that will go down well politically, but misses the point entirely, and not only misses the point entirely, but in fact makes it more difficult to address the real issues. Uh, uh, this, this, this is quite an interesting one that's popped up from uh, quite a while ago, uh, and this was an article from last year, um, and this article was referring to reports from 2017, which is quite nice. Some media reports um, linking some Institute of Race Relations members with petitioning Helen Ziller to leave the DA and head up her own truly liberal party. Of course, you denied the rumors at the time, and now you're part of the Institute of Race Relations. Is this just a voice for you, perhaps, uh, to get back into politics again? <laughs> I'm still a member of the DA, yeah, and I signed up my membership again, renewed it yesterday. And I will continue using the DA as my party political vehicle, but that doesn't mean to say I can't belong to an NGO as well. Many people belong to a party political vehicle. I'm just an ordinary member of the DA. I've got absolutely no position there, and my time as leader of the DA is well and truly over. I don't ever and have not interfered in the leadership decisions. But um, I want to advance the values for which I originally stood under apartheid, fighting racism, fighting institutionalized racism, fighting for an inclusive society for all, and building the non-racial moderate center of politics. And I will continue to do that. And that platform gives me a voice to do that. Well, we look forward to some of your writings and your views. Uh, good luck with your, with your appointment. And uh, thanks for talking to us and uh, sharing your point it's of view on pleasure. many issues. Thanks very much, Helen Ziller, talking to us. And thank you us. for being so well prepared and having good questions. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it was really good. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Uh, great talking to Helen Zilla once again. All right. It is 8 o'clock here on the program. I look forward to reading your views on that particular one, and we'll share them with you in a short while. But Sakina, I'm going to hand this one over to you.